of insecurity, socioeconomic challenges into glorious light of dawn that would herald greater things for the country and the citizens because the spirit of God is in the land. Already positive signs of changes are in the air. Let me also use the opportunity to encourage you to use the crusade to pray, to study, and to deliberate on important issues concerning the evangelization in Nigeria, pastoral care of the faithful, as well as promotion of human dignity, human right, truth, justice, reconciliation, peace, and wholesome development of Nigeria and the sanctity of its territorial integrity. As you pray for our dear beloved nation, may the peace and progress and prosperity of Nigeria during this crusade lift the spirit to greater heights. Please accept, as always, the assurances of my highest regards and respect. Happy Easter. Senator George Akume, CON, Secretary to the Government of the Federation. Thank you, Papa. Lord. Praise the Lord. The hour we're waiting for has come. I said the hour we're waiting for has come. Ladies and gentlemen, our father, the convener of GCK, need no long introduction. We have just seen what the Lord did just yesterday. A 16-year-old girl crawling like an animal got up. I said, got up after the prayer of the anointed man of God. And now, today will be greater. It's your time to receive. Join me to bring to the podium our father, the, GC, the convener of the GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Everybody, praise the Lord. <clears throat> and the Lord is doing miracles for individuals, for families. He'll do miracles for our nation. As we see, those who are getting up from the predicament, polio, paralysis, and we can see the definite manifestation of the love and the might of the Lord on individuals. Taraba stage will get up. Yeah. Northeast will get up. Yeah. Our nation, Nigeria, will progress with peace and prosperity in Jesus' name. Yeah. Remain standing. We're praying for our nation. Father, we thank you. You made us and you put us in this country. And it's not the map, it's the people that make up Nigeria. So, Lord, we're asking all the problems we have threatening our nation, threatening the peace, the unity, and the progress of our nation bring an end to those problems in Jesus' name. Peace on our land. Progress in our land. 
prosperity on the people of this land, this nation, in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, that once again, the giant of Africa will rise up. We will be what you have ordained this giant Nigeria to become. We pray, Lord, tonight, you seal, you cover, you protect all that we have prayed for. Lord, we know it is done. We, your children, will remain alive to see this great wonder in our land in Nigeria. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We'll carry amen. Taraba stage, amen. North East, amen. Amen from the whole of Nigeria. The Lord has answered our prayer. Here we are tonight. Here you, th you are there tonight. And we're going to talk more about Jesus. And every need of your life will be met in Jesus' name. Father, we adore you. We we'll worship you. We honor you. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge your presence, your power, your provision here. Holy Spirit, we know that you are here and you care for everyone. And I pray that the Spirit of God will move everywhere tonight and do wonders, miracles, signs in every life. Confirm it to Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're still talking about Jesus, the all-sufficient Jesus. And tonight, we're looking at John chapter 7, John chapter 8, and John chapter 9. We're talking about Jesus, the fountain of fullness, freedom, and fitness. It says it all, Jesus, the fountain of fullness, the fountain of freedom, and the fountain of fitness. Look at John chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. You'll quench your thirst tonight. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, it says in verse 39, But they spake him of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That Holy Spirit is here tonight. That Holy Spirit is right by you tonight. And you will do wonders in your life, in your soul, in your spirit, in your body, in your family, all over. The crusade ground tonight, the Holy Spirit will move in an unprecedented manner. You'll go back home with the joy of that spirit in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 8. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I didn't hear your amen for that one. Your freedom is established by Christ who says everyone free. And he breaks every yoke. He tells us in verse 36. And he says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. We're coming to chapter 9. 
And I'm reading from verse 10. Chapter 9, verse 10. Therefore said thee unto him, How were thine, black, were thine eyes opened? In verse 11, he said, He answered and said, A man, his name is Jesus, a man, that's our Savior, that's our Redeemer, that's the one that brings us out of darkness and he brings us into the light. A man that is called Jesus. Shout that name. Jesus. I give light to the blind eyes tonight. Those dim eyesights and those blind eyes tonight is your night to receive your miracle sight. Glaucoma will be of the past. Cataract will be of the past. Amen. And all those health problems confronting your eyes. Tonight, those eyes will come bright in Jesus' name. A man called Jesus made claim and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received sight. I went. I did what he told me to do. I received sight. Once you do what he tells you to do tonight, how simple it might be. Stand up. You'll stand up. Open your eyes and see. You'll open your eyes and see. And if you're deaf and dumb, I will speak to you. The word will enter you. Dumbness will vanish away. And deafness will vanish away in Jesus' name. You have any swelling, fibroid, you have cancer, you have whatever tonight. As you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, all those things will vanish away from your life. Because we're talking about Jesus, the fountain of fullness, freedom, and fitness. Looking at those three chapters tonight, we are dividing the message to three parts. Number one, is the living fountain of the spirit for the thirsty. Number two is the liberation, the liberating freedom, the giver, the liberating freedom giver, forgiving and freeing the sinful from all transgressions. Number three is the light, the light of the world, giving sight and insight through the transforming truth. Look at number one there. Number one, we're looking at the living fountain of the spirit for the thirsty. It's very important for the thirsty in pouring out the Holy Spirit. God does not make any exception. God does not differentiate, distinguish from A and B and C. Everyone Everyone can have the touch of the Spirit, the transformation of the Spirit, the truth of the Spirit, and we can have His fullness. Why? Because He is good unto all. And He wants to fill everyone with the Spirit of peace, the Spirit of purity, and the Spirit of power, the spirit of progress that makes us moving on and marching on so that the progress is ordained for our lives we have by the spirit. Look at John again, chapter 7, reading from verse 37, the living fountain of the spirit for the thirsty. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, if any man thirst, the moment you are born into the world, you are thirsty. 
Look at that baby just born and cries for satisfaction. He don't, the baby does not know. They call it water. They call it milk. Doesn't know. But that baby knows I'm thirsty for something. And then as the baby is growing, as a toddler now, he's thirsty for something. He knows, that baby knows, I need to play with something. I need to have toys. And the baby, is the toddler, is asking for, is passionate for, and is desiring so that he will have what is desiring and as the baby sees other people walking and standing and playing that baby is thirsty so that i want to do like they're doing i want to rise like they're rising i want to walk like they're walking from my life so to the baby stage and the toddler stage we desire something. We're thirsty for something. And then the baby begins to try. He stands up and he falls down. But because he's thirsty, he does not give up. He begins to go on and then falling down. Eventually, he now can't walk. And then he sees all that little children older than himself. They're playing on the field. And he's looking at them. There is a drive. There is a desire. There is a thirst. I want to be like them. And then he sees the seniors going to school. And the baby also wants, he wants to play with the uh, watercolor. He wants to play with, you know, the brushes because it is created in man that we must us. And when you grow up in life and you've got this and you've got that, the only challenge now is you are not as good as you want to be. You are not as morally sound as you want to be. We begin to desire he tells lies, but I don't want this. He deceives, but I don't want this. He sees his weakness, and he's asking, he's thirsty for strength. He's thirsty for moral life. He's thirsty for a good life. And then he comes across Jesus, that thirst is met, but he is also sick, and he's thirsty. You know, in our lives, you're sick, unhealthy, and you're thirsty, I want to get well. And that's the reason people will go everywhere, anywhere is the thirst that is driving us to go there, to go there, everywhere. And as we come tonight, we're thirsty. I am thirsty. I want to get something, something that will enrich my life. Something that will refresh my life. Something that will calm all the strong desires I have that I have not been able to satisfy. Tonight, satisfaction for you. Everything you thirsty of, the Spirit of God will do it in your life in Jesus' name. And you know, as we grow and we we'll see what's happening in the lives of other people. And you ask yourself, how are they able to do that? Then they mention one word, power. Power in the spirit. Power in your mind. Power in your life. And then you say, you look at yourself, you say, honestly, I have to accept I am powerless. Many things I want to do, I cannot get done. I'm powerless. Then you begin to thirst for power. That's why you are here tonight. You're thirsty for the power of God in your person, in your personality, in your life. That power will happen tonight in Jesus' name. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. You will drink tonight. And the power of the Lord will set to your life. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, he that believeth on me. Our thirst begins with the salvation of the Lord. I will believe on him. 
We're thirsty for that new life. We're thirsty for that saving grace. We're thirsty for that salvation which the Lord has brought. And then we're told the power of salvation comes through believing on him. He that believeth on me. And then after we're saved, like those disciples of Christ, there was something going on. And they came to them and they could not do it. Do you what they seen Jesus doing? And they came and they said, why couldn't we do that? Even though they had the power for salvation, they knew there was a kind of power they did not have, the power over the spirits. And again, as they thirsted for that, we find that later in the Acts of the Apostles, they had power over the spirits. And now there's something else. There's something bubbling in them. And it it's like wanting to have the wrong power over other people. They wanted to be here the greatest, here the most exalted, and Jesus said, it shall not be so. And they began to thirst that they will have the kind of heart, the kind of mind that Jesus had, the power for sanctification. We put it together as purity. And all the, I'm better than you, I'm greater than you are, all the fact that I want to scale the mountain and I want you to remain in the valley, all that give them the thirst. We're not totally like Jesus who humbled himself. I want to be humble and meek and lowly. And the Lord said, the thirst you have, is the power, the purity in sanctification. And he prayed for them. You are there tonight, you are saved. You are there tonight, you are born again. And you are thirsty. You say, I'm not as gentle as I ought to be. I'm not as righteous as I ought to be. I'm not as pure internally in my thoughts as I ought to be. You are thirsty for something. And it's for the purity in sanctification. He'll give it to you tonight in Jesus' name. And then Jesus was about to go. And he was sorrowful. And he said, why are you sorrowful? I just told you now, I'm going back to the heavenly father. He was sorrowful because who will open blind eyes after he's gone? They were sorrowful because who will make the lame to walk after he's gone? They were sorrowful because although... They had peace in their heart. They had purity in their lives. They were now thirsty for the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, they were thirsty for the fullness of what God has to offer. That fullness is coming to you tonight. That's why Jesus said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be enveloped and until ye be totally empowered by the Spirit of God. He said, For ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. At that time, they were fearful of Jerusalem. They were fearful of the powers that be in Jerusalem. And they locked themselves up behind almost the iron curtain. And Jesus said, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. And then in Judea. And then in Samaria. And to the uttermost part of the earth. When Jesus mentioned that, their, their thirst became more acute. That's what I want. I want to be able to stand in Jerusalem and those people have been afraid of. I want to stand in the power of the Holy Ghost. They were thirsty. And not many days after I was sitting in one place, the Holy Ghost descended upon them. And in that same chapter 2 of Acts, Peter stood up and he said what he never could have said in the power of the Spirit of God. And 3,000 became born again and transformed. Power will come upon your life. And you will turn thousands of people 
to the right side of the Lord in Jesus' name. But it's thirst. It's thirst. You're sick. You want to get healed. You're thirsty. You are oppressed. You want to get free. You're thirsty. You are powerless. You want to get the power of the Lord. You're thirsty. He and you believe on him. As the scripture has said, out of his belly. You didn't know you had anything in your belly, in your inner man before, but now peace was settled in your inner man. Purity will settle in your inner man. And the power of the Spirit of God will settle in your inner man in Jesus' name. And out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, in verse 39, but they speak he of the Spirit which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. It tells us in Acts chapter 2. Acts, sorry, Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, I'm reading from verse 3. For I will pour water on him that is thirsty. Amen. God said, I'm looking for those who are thirsty. And I'm going to pour water on them. Uh, uh, water represents something refreshing, something renewing, something transforming, something uh, that makes the dairy weak, dry life to become revitalized. And it says, if that is your thirst, if that is your desire, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. And my blessing, look at that. The water comes upon the dry land and the spirit comes upon the thirsty. And then it says, and my blessing upon my offspring. Blessing tonight. I said, Blessing tonight. And everything that has dried up in your life, everything is going to be poured out upon you tonight in Jesus' name. And look at look at Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and, and then Peter said, Unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Those people saw the freedom in Peter, the freedom in all the apostles, and they wondered, how could these people be so free? And see how they're talking freely, and see how they're pouring out their heart. We want to have what they have, you will have. They had had forgiveness. They had had freedom. They had had the purity. They had had the power. And as they stood up preaching, as they stood up expressing themselves with total abandonment and freedom, the people said, what shall we do? We have guilt that pins us down. We have guilt that you know, holds us back. What do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, removal, forgiveness of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift. It's a gift, but you must be thirsty. As you are thirsty tonight, you receive the gift of salvation, the gift of sanctification, the gift of the Spirit, all available for you because it says in verse 39, verse 39, for the promise is unto you. The promise is unto you. You're thirsty, come and drink. You're desirous, come and drink. You're passionate, come and drink. And you want the fullness of the presence of the Lord in your life. The promise is unto you. 
and to your children and to all and to all and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling me. As many as the Lord our God shall call, as you respond to that call, peace will flood your heart. Peace will flood your heart. Purity will saturate your being. And power will envelope you. Power. You'll be immersed in the power of the Spirit. Number one, then, the living fountain of the Spirit for the thirsty. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at the life-breaching freedom. Freedom giver. Forgiven. I'm freeing the sinful from all transgressions. This chapter 8 is uh, very important, very instructive, very inspiring. What happened here? There was a woman who, had, who was caught in, an, in a situation where she should not have been. Now, I said who was caught. I didn't say who committed because as for committing sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Pharisees who were sinners themselves, they were looking around and they caught her. And yet the Spirit of God will catch the catchers. You didn't hear that one. The Lord will catch the catchers. And so, as they caught her, they were not thinking about their own lives. They brought her. Actually, they forced her, dragged her onto Jesus. And they said, we caught this woman. Listen to the whole story. And she had committed this. Moses said, we should cast stone on her so that she will die. They said, what do you say? When you have guilt, condemnation, don't stay with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the holier than thou people. Don't stay with them. Because all they be asking for is to crush you. Condemn you. Crucify you. Get rid of you. But thank God. Somebody say thank God. They brought the catchers who caught her. They brought her to Jesus. The best place anybody can bring you to. When there's guilt. When there's condemnation. When you've done something wrong. The best person anyone can report you to is to report you to Jesus. I said it's to report you to Jesus. Those Pharisees, they became, they didn't know, they didn't know, they didn't know, they became evangelists because after they caught the woman, they brought her to Jesus. But they were expecting one thing, that Jesus, who is so holy, who is so pure, who is so great, so heavenly that the end has come for this woman. No. When you come to Jesus, your life is just beginning. End will not come for you. But I have sinned. We'll bring you to the Savior. But I'm guilty. But we'll bring you to the grace giver. Grace will come to you tonight. <clears throat> and so... Jesus said, he that has no sin among you, let him take the first stone and, ca and cast at her. And he was writing on the ground. And they became convicted. And Jesus caught them. He will catch all your catchers. 
of the people that are seeking. You're too big a sinner. You're too great a sinner. The next thing for you is death. And the thing Jesus is going to agree with them. Jesus will never agree with the people that want to stone you and kill you because you've done something they call unforgivable sin. And so all of them, one by one, went away. They'll go away. They'll not oppress your life. They'll not threaten your life. Because Jesus has become the freedom giver. And he forgives all your sin and sets you free. The great mistake that woman could have made is to leave Christ while those people accusing her, while they were going, the greatest mistake of the century would have been for the woman to also follow them. They will destroy her. You will not follow them. She stayed there quiet before Jesus. And so Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. You didn't say amen to that one. That woman breathed down. Neither do I condemn thee. Jesus, the righteous, the pure, the perfect, and I am imperfect, and I've gone so far to do this. He was expecting he that has no sin, and Jesus had no sin, to take up the stone. And Jesus was qualified to take up the stone and stone her because she was, he was perfect beyond any perfection on earth. But Jesus will not condemn you. Jesus will not stone you. Jesus will not drive you to hell. He'll say, I come to the world for people like you. And you have come, whatever you've seen, you came, whoever brought you, Pharisees, Sadducees, whoever announced, and then you came, forgiveness is now certain for you. He says, neither do I condemn you. Because he came to the world not to condemn, he came to save. Whatever your life has been, and you are thirsty for a better life, for a transformed life, a change of life, condemnation is gone. That thirst that makes you feel, that makes you say, I want a better life, that better life is coming tonight. I want a righteous life, that righteous life has come tonight. Go and sin no more. What? Go and sin no more. Nobody ever could say that to any man, to any woman. The Old Testament priests, they'll say, okay, we're tuned for your sin now. Go, come back on the day of atonement. So we'll make a covering for your sin again year after year. Year after year. They have to keep on the sacrifice because there's no power to deliver anyone from sinning and sinning and sinning. But Jesus said, you are forgiven now. And with the forgiveness, I give you freedom. Freedom for you. Freedom for you. Go and sin no more. The grace, the power, the strength, the desire to live a new life. You have that tonight in Jesus' name. My condemnation is cancelled. I didn't hear you. My condemnation is cancelled. Say it. My condemnation is cancelled. <clears throat> My death sentence is cancelled. You will not die in sin. New life has now come. Neither does heaven condemn you. The heavens through Christ have given you forgiveness tonight. Go 
of the new strength and see no more. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, then speak Jesus again unto them. Now, he's speaking to the woman. He's speaking now to everyone else. He's speaking to you, speaking to me, and speaking to everyone, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. Referring to that woman, she'll not walk in the darkness of immorality anymore. She'll not walk in the darkness of iniquity anymore. She'll not walk in the darkness of, um, you know, evil transgression anymore. And from her to everyone else, it says, he that follows after me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. I have. Everybody, I have the light of life. He comes to you, and then he gives you this light, and he gives you this grace. It tells us there in verse 30, look at verse 30 there, in verse 30, as they speak these words, Many believed on him. And as you hear these words, your heart is now saying, I didn't know that. Now I know that Jesus forgives and Jesus sets free. I believe. As he spake the words, many believed on him. Verse 31, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if he continue in my word. I will continue. I will continue. What does that mean? Come back to the woman. That woman heard the word of forgiveness, the assurance of forgiveness. Go. And as she went, she must continue in the confidence, in the assurance, God has forgiven me. Doubts may come. He may see some of the relatives of the, sorry, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Seeing them, there may be doubt, but you continue in my word, neither do I condemn you. He wants you to continue in that to know he is not coming to condemn you. He has come to save you. And you keep on saying, I am saved. I am saved. And then he says, go and sin no more. You must continue in that. He spoke the word. And this word he spoke. Gave me the power to stand. And now I can live a righteous life. One day at a time. The old temptations will come. No. He told me go and sin no more. And I continue in that. What Jesus said if he continue in my word, all the other people there too, having freedom in Christ and having forgiveness through Christ, having the assurance that he had forgiven them, he had saved them, and that he had the grace to keep them standing on that word. All they need to do is say, there's a new day, I'll continue. There's a new day. Uh, this is a new challenge. I will continue. And this is a new pressure coming upon my life. But there's something I must continue in the word of Christ. You will continue. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. And you look at verse 32. In verse 32, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Say that with me. And ye shall know the truth. Say it aloud. And the truth shall make you free. Every truth you hear about Jesus makes you free and free and free and you are free in Jesus name. We're coming to point number three here. Point number three, the light of the world giving sight and insight through transforming truth. 
Look at chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 4. John chapter 9. We're reading from verse, reading from verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. I must work the works of him that sent me. The question is, what the work of him that sent Christ, that sent Jesus, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He was looking for you. You are lost in the jungle. You are lost in confusion. And he was looking for you, seeking to save. What well, the work that you must do, I must work the works of him that sent me. Your salvation. Your salvation for him is a must. It says, come unto me, O ye that labor, and I be lady, and I will give you rest. And it says, he must. He must. You know, some people think, if I pray, if I cry, if I shout, if I roll on the ground, if I do some things, I will have salvation. No, there's a must in the Savior. A must in Christ. I must walk the works of him that sent me. And tonight, that work of salvation, he must do. He will do in your life. He will save you. And whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast off. I must work. What work? The work of healing. Because that's the work he came to do. He came to restore your body to the normal, healthy position. That's why he went, uh, he went about in chapter 5. He saw a man uh, that lied there. He's been there for 38 years. And Jesus said, there's a must for me here. I must raise up this man. Because that's the work that he came to do. And the Lord sees you there tonight. You're sick. You're sad. You're sorrowful. And you are impotent. You cannot walk now. The work of Christ that he must do is to raise you up from that wheelchair tonight. The work of Christ that he must do is to take those crutches out of your hand and to strengthen your feet and you will rise and walk in Jesus' name. Are you blind? He has a work to do. He has a work to do. And he says, I must work. It's going to open your blind eyes. You've gone to the people, good people, uh, experts to help you. But the help has not come like you thought. And here you are tonight. What problem you brought, what sickness you brought that they could not deal. There is Jesus here tonight. He's looking at you. He said, there's something I must do do tonight before these people go back home the person that appears incurable I must work it will work in your life today there are the works of the devil that the devil has scattered everywhere depression disease evil things oppression upon the lives of people and Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil in your brain, you must destroy. The work of the devil, that thing running about in your body and is causing discomfort, you must destroy that tonight. And all the things, look at a man, we need blood so that we remain alive, but the blood is, you know, flowing out and gushing out of him. And if the blood continues like that, he may die. But Jesus said, I must work and remove that flow of blood so that you will live. I said you will live. <laughs> then there's somebody <clears throat> who was born blind. 
And disciples were asking, who sinned that this man was born blind? Was he the sin of the parents? Was it his own sin? And Jesus said, none of that, but that the glory of God may be fulfilled. That's the work. That's the work. He wants to do something for you. That the glory of God will shine forth in your life in Jesus' name. And so the man who was born blind got to Jesus. And Jesus made clay and put in the eyes. And said, go and wash that off. He wanted to test his obedience. He could have said, blind eyes be open. And it will open. But then uh, he sent him, uh, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And you will come back seen. And the man did not argue. You did it for others like this, like that. Why don't you do it for me like this, like that? We never argue on the one. He knows his work. It's like you telling the doctor, oh, why do you have to, you know, mix that, all those chemicals? Why don't you do it this way? If you knew how to do it yourself, why did you go to the doctor? But now the, one, the man did not argue. You will not argue. I will not argue. And he went exactly as Jesus had said, and he washed, lo and behold, that darkness, that blindness, he was born with, everything cleared away immediately. That infirmity you were born with, everything was clear away immediately. And he came back, and he came back, and they asked him, how are you seeing? He said, a man, the man of God, and the son of man. He made clay, rubbed in my eyes. I came back now after obeying him, and now I can see. And now you can see. And now you can stand. And now you are made whole. That the work of Christ until today is still saying, I must walk. On you there, he must walk. Amen. On her there, it, he must walk. Amen. The work of salvation, it will save you right now. He must understand that. He must. I must walk the work of salvation. He must. I must walk the work of healing. He must. He will work the work of deliverance. It's available for you. For me. Where are you? For me. I say, where are you? For me. Tonight, he'll do the work of wonders in every life in Jesus' name. It's bowed and eyes closed. It's bowed and eyes closed. Here is your time. To have the forgiveness. Neither do I condemn you. Maybe you're looking for condemnation. I'm so bad I should be condemned. No, Christ says he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came to forgive. He came to set you free. And you have uh, that gracious uh, uh, giving of the Lord tonight that he will save you from all your sin. Just raise up your hand. Just raise up your hand. I want that salvation. I want that forgiveness. And this is what he must do. He must, before you go tonight, he must forgive you. He must set you free. He must save you. And you want that salvation now? Just raise up your hand there. That salvation will come immediately. Why don't you stand up, please? Stand up. If you are raising up your hand, I want that work of salvation to be done in me, he will do it now. Stand up there, stand up there. I'm still waiting for, you know, that person who should have forgiveness, who should have salvation, who should have the freedom. I'm waiting for that person. Raise up your hand and stand up. Thank you very much. God bless you there. Anywhere you are, online, radio, television, they said the work he must do to give you salvation. 
as you raise up your hand, you are standing up. We're praying together now. Father, in the wonderful, peaceful, maj uh, ma majestic name of Jesus, we're asking that all these who have raised up their hands, all these who are standing up, I pray that your forgiveness will come to everyone. Condemnation will be cancelled. Spiritual death will be cancelled. And the joy of salvation, the evidence of salvation, the reality of salvation will come in every one of them right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we know this work of salvation you must do. You have done it. He has done it. Your sins are forgiven. And now he gives you the grace and the strength and he gives you the enablement to go and sin no more. You are now a candidate of heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Keep on standing. Keep on standing. Our counselors are there. They'll help you. They'll put down your name so we can do proper follow-up on you. We're calling on the officiating minister tonight uh, to take over this session. And then after this session now, the work he must do to heal you, I'll come back. You're getting your healing tonight. Congratulations for coming to the kingdom of God this night. Our counselors, please spread yourselves everywhere. All our counselors, our pastors, ushers, group pastors, overseers, wherever you are, please leave what you are doing now. This is a very important aspect of this great program. Go into the crowd. Go to the far back. Spread yourselves to the, line, to the right hand side, to the left hand side, towards the back. Up to the roadside. Spread yourselves. Don't stay in one place. Don't be clustered around one place. Spread yourselves. Some of you that are still um, going gently, move quickly into the crowd. Please uh, keep standing. Don't sit down until they have attended to you, please. All those that have made decisions tonight, don't sit down until they have attended to you. Our counselors, go down to the second field. There are a lot of people there. Under the trees. To my right, I can see some people there, please. Go and meet them. Please provide the correct information, your name, in capital letters, your phone number. Now that you are a child of God, you cannot tell lies, give the correct phone number. Our counselors check up to make sure that 
the phone numbers are correct. Give the correct description of how we can locate you. It can be near a school or near one very important location that's so popular. Indicate it. Councillors do a very good job. Don't leave any detail. But we fast about it. Take down all the details. The name. The phone number. Give the correct description. Our converse is to help you. It's so that we can trace you and help you. So please give the counselors the correct information. The decision you made today is the best decision in your life. And we congratulate you. Councillors, go to the far back. If you are finished toward the front, go toward the back. <laughs>